Hi, I'm Santa Clara County Supervisor Dave Cortesi, and I'm here in the Diablo Range on the edge of Santa Clara County's Silicon Valley. And I'm here to bring a message to you about climate change at the second annual Climate Restoration Summit put on by the Foundation for Climate Restoration. You know, last year I spoke about all the things we're doing as a county to, to try to combat uh, global warming, climate change, and protect humanity from its own destruction. Little did I know that this year at this time, uh, in September of 2020, I'd be standing on my grandfather's family farm here in the Mount Hamilton Range, destroyed by the effects of, of climate change, years of drought, combined with lightning strikes that we've never seen before in the month of August here in this part of California. 50 square miles has burned like this. Grazeland, farmland, oak chaparrales, all destroyed. The livelihoods of people, structures, dwelling units, water tanks, water troughs, Yes, we have all that in Silicon Valley. There's still 15,000 agricultural workers in Santa Clara County, the heart of Silicon Valley. This is not just an urban environment that's at risk from sea level rise from the San Francisco Bay. Yes, that's happening. This is an area that's also at risk of climate change and the climate crisis when it comes to wildfires. That's no secret, but I wanted you to see firsthand what happens to somebody's 60 year old family farm when we don't take this crisis seriously. Thank you all for the work that you're doing. We can reverse the effects of the climate crisis. We can do that one person at a time, one town at a time, one county at a time, one ranch at a time, one mountain range at a time, one nation at a time, if we do it together. Let's get it done. Thank you and God bless you. Hello and good afternoon. It's a pleasure and indeed an honor to be part of the second annual Global Climate Restoration Forum. Personally, I have been actively supporting the Foundation for Climate Restoration for several years now, and it is really quite amazing and exciting to see the momentum for climate restoration grow so rapidly. As the European strategist for the foundation, I'm connected to and involved with various parties that we feel are important to join us in what we are doing. Those parties include governments on a local, national and supranational level and the Vatican. Now the presence of the Vatican in this summary may seem a bit odd, but believe me, it is not. You know, five years ago, Pope Francis presented the encyclical letter Laudato Si, on care for our common home, perhaps the most astonishing and most ambitious papal document of the past 100 years, since it addresses not just the Catholics or Christians, but to everyone on earth. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis draws all people into a dialogue about the state of our common home and how to protect and restore it. And we now know that when the Pope talks about restoring our common home, that includes climate restoration, as he stated recently. Climate restoration is of utmost importance since we are in the midst of a climate emergency, were the exact words he used. And he added, we are run of, running out of time, as our children and young people have reminded us. The Vatican has announced that this and next year will be a special Laudato Si anniversary year. One of the events on the agenda is a proposed gathering of the world's most prominent religious leaders to be held in early spring 2021. At first sight, it does not yet feature in bold letters and exclamation points on the agenda. And I'm afraid at this point, I'm not allowed to give too many details on what the gathering will actually be about. But I can tell you, that since the Foundation for Climate Restoration is very much involved in the preparations and execution of the gathering, I think it is safe to say that the words climate, action, and restoration 
will play an important role at the gathering. I am sure that in the coming weeks and months, you will hear much more about what will undoubtedly become a historic and unprecedented event next spring. For now, I wish you all a very successful forum. Thank you. My name is Kathleen Rogers and I'm president of Earth Day Network and I'm a very proud partner of the Foundation for Climate Restoration. Earth Day Network just celebrated its 50th anniversary and in celebration we're marking 2021 as the year to restore the planet. We fully support the Foundation for Climate Restoration and agree with the organization's vision that we will not have a sustainable planet unless we include restoration along with the mitigation and adaptation as part of our urgent climate actions. Earth Day Network intends to leverage its global partners, and we have many, to advocate for and to raise awareness about the ways we can achieve restoration. I'm very excited to virtually join the second annual conference on September 15th and 16th. After joining their initial launch last year, I am thrilled by the progress that has been made and to be able to participate once again in this important event. In the near term, Earth Day Network, like many of us, are launching campaigns here in the United States focused on voting. And ours is called Vote Earth, Vote Early. We are encouraging our community to take a stand for the planet and vote this November. We are thrilled to be working with the Foundation for Climate Restoration on Vote Earth, Vote Early. And together, I believe our partnership can have large scale implications. I am hopeful the world will come together in support of restoring the clam climate and saving our planet Earth. And please take a look at the short video, our Vote Earth, Vote Early, PSA. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lynn Twist. I'm Bill Twist. We're the co-founders of the Pachamama Alliance. Along with our good friend, John Perkins. And we are just delighted to be partners with the Foundation for Climate Restoration. We know that work is very, very important. It's important to us, it's important to the world, and we're delighted and honored to be partnering with the Foundation. Yeah, that the Foundation has set a clear objective, an inspiring and clear objective is pulling lots of organizations together, especially ourselves, and we're delighted to be working with the Foundation for Climate Restoration. And we, uh, we do a lot of work in the um, Ecuadorian Amazon and Peruvian Amazon. We have something called the uh, Sacred Headwaters Initiative that we do, and um, we'd like to show a short film about the work we do in the Amazon, which is also about not only restoration, but permanent protected status. So here we go. The vast Amazon rainforest, larger than the United States, breathes in carbon dioxide and breathes out oxygen. Its billions of trees lift water vapor into the sky, forming massive flying rivers that bring rain to the entire continent and help regulate the Earth's climate. We have known for decades that this great forest is under attack. Oil drilling and mining pollutes rivers and poisons land threatening the lives and livelihood of indigenous cultures. Vast swaths of forest have been cut down and burned to make way for cattle and farming. But recently, the world woke up to a frightening new dimension of the crisis. We watched with helplessness the accelerating destruction of a precious ecosystem, crucial to life on planet Earth. It seemed a metaphor for the future. We are burning down tomorrow. But here, in Ecuador and Peru, at the headwaters of the great Amazon River, where the forest is still pristine, something remarkable is happening. Twenty indigenous nations have come together and are working with allies to form an unprecedented alliance committed to the permanent protection of one of the most biodiverse places on Earth. 
Through the Amazon Sacred Headwaters Initiative, they are calling for halting the expansion of extractive industries and making 74 million acres of rainforest a sanctuary for nature and for humanity. They envision continuing to live in harmony with nature while pursuing their livelihood in the forest and safeguarding the vital organs of the earth for all of life. They are calling for global partners to join them in this historic endeavor and have it serve as a new model for humanity's future. Not only for safeguarding rainforests and keeping fossil fuels in the ground, but also for creating a mutually enhancing human-Earth relationship that is so vital to the future of all life on this planet. are proud to be a part of the second annual Climate Restoration Forum. World War was founded on the principle that achieving net zero was simply not enough to provide us with a safe and prosperous a future as possible and stop millions of people from suffering and dying. Already today, the consequences of the climate crisis are causing unimaginable damage and pain. And with the tipping points and the sea level rise, even if we did achieve net zero, it will only get worse. And more than that, net zero is not the end. The crisis would remain catastrophic for centuries to come, even in the best case scenario. So, we realized it was time for a new ambition, climate restoration. For us, restoration is simple. The ambition to reduce emissions to a real zero as soon as possible and remove as much CO2 from the atmosphere as we can so we can restore the climate. Can we do it? Who knows? But we must try to stop catastrophe for millions. Even if we fail, we achieve net zero. If we succeed, we can usher a brighter future for all. It's not up to us to plan out the exact way to do it. There are many technological, economic and political pathways to do it. None of them are easy. The scale of removals is a huge scale task. But it's necessary to stop millions suffering and prevent unimaginable social, economic and ecological damage. In 2100, I will be 97. Will I have had a life with a climate with constantly worsening or at least as bad as present? Natural disasters, a life without sea level rise submerging cities? Or Will I have had a life where we turn the tide on climate crisis and start to reverse these impacts? Through Worldwood, the youth speak loud and clear. We need restoration. We want a future better than our past. A climate safer than at present. A world brighter than today. We need it. But restoration is the only way to achieve it. We're so happy you're all here today to discuss restoration. And we are proud to be able to speak to you. But we urge you to listen to us. The house is already on fire. We must put it out, not just contain it. The climate crisis is already unacceptable. We have to reverse it. And if not now, when? Hi, my name is Alejandra De La Fuente and I am a senior at the Convent of the Sacred Heart in New York City. What motivated me to get involved in climate action? Living in a city full of consumerism and waste like New York made me want to learn about the environment and our negative effects on our world. 
After taking part of my school's environmental club for three years, I felt like I wanted to take action outside of my school and family community. This is when I decided to join FXB, a climate activist organization with people my age in which we talk about environmental issues facing us. What does restoring the climate mean to me? To me, restoring the climate means taking steps to reverse the damage we have done and continue to do to our planet. In my opinion, it is more of a progressive plan of action due to its three pillars of education, advocacy, and research and innovation. What role do I think movement building plays in climate change? Movement building plays a huge part in trying to restore the climate because we need to be united in order to combat this issue. Getting more people to be part of the fight will only help our progress in returning our world into a stable condition. What is my advice to others wanting to support the movement? From everything I've learned so far about this movement and the issues that we are facing, the greatest lesson I have learned is that everybody's impact has an effect on the rest of the world. This goes from the effect that we have on the people around us, to the air we breathe, and to our ecosystems in whole. So the greatest advice to give to anybody wanting to support or join the movement is to first start by becoming aware of your actions and the impacts that they have on the environment around us. Hi, my name is Amanda Zhang. I'm a senior from Northville High School in Metro Detroit, Michigan, and I'm a climate activist. I got involved with climate action about a year ago when I was finishing up my school year and I was reflecting on everything that had happened. And I realized that after years of waking up to news about a starving polar bear or a wildfire or another area of polluted skies, that I was so frustrated and restless at the lack of progress globally towards creating a greener world. I thought that there'd be more done by now. And I thought that if I'd play my part of doing the three R's, I would be a good citizen. But last year, when I was reflecting, I realized that there are so many more things that need to be done, and three R's are definitely not enough. So what I ended up doing is I recruited one of my best friends, and we began a project together. We worked for eight months, and we successfully got our high school to switch from styrofoam to reusable plastic lunch trays. But that's just one example of what you can do. To me, the entirety of climate restoration is about protecting the ending of my story. I am looking at myself and my friends and all the other people in my generation, as well as future generations, and I am so pained to hear that the ending of our lives is being written now, and I'm not okay with that, especially because so many of our lives have barely begun and so as i looked more and deeper into the environmentalism community and the statistics about how much time we have left i realized that the world does not have time to wait for young people to grow up and become the next politicians and business moguls and scientists to take action rather we need to start taking action now otherwise we might reach that point of no return. So that's what I did. And for those of you who are thinking about getting started in the environmentalism community or are already into it and are just trying to find some ideas, I highly recommend you just look at your lifestyle, make those little adjustments, or take on a personal project within your community. You don't have to do a super elaborate thing. You don't need to lead a citywide march or speak in front of the UN to make some important change. Whether that's using one less plastic coffee cup or starting your own project, maybe getting rid of styrofoam cups at your school, all of that helps. And by all means, just go for it. And don't even bother with asking for permission. Just do whatever you need to do and don't ask for permission about if it makes sense or if it if it's feasible does it make sense financially you'll figure out a way you will find out and 
all of that helps our community. I love environmentalism. I think it's a great fight, and I think we can win it. But we would need all the help we can get, and we would love to have you. Thanks. Hey, everyone. My name is Ansh Patel, and I'm a rising junior at Monroe Township High School. Today, I'm going to be talking about climate restoration. What does climate restoration mean to me? Well, to me, it means many things. However, the most important is sustainability. What is sustainability? Well, sustainability is using resources in such a way that future generations have the ability to thrive and survive. What keeps me motivated to pursue change and pursue change for the better? Well, many things motivate me to continue trying to help with make a change for the better, but I think the most imp motivating factor is that one day our efforts will bear fruit and the world will be better. I want to leave this earth making a difference and I want to leave my footprint on this earth. What are common misconceptions that I face on basically a daily basis? Well, one is that one person won't make a change. In fact, one person does make a change and that one person influences other people to make a change and after a while, months later, you got thousands and thousands of people trying to make a change for the better and that's deadly. That that will result in change and in, in, in this case it will result a change for the better. What is some advice that I can give to peers trying to do the same thing that I am trying to do? Well, one thing I can say is join an organization trying to make a change. For me, I'm a FXB climate advocate and I think that I've learned so much through so many podcasts and honestly, it's a great experience all around. And using that knowledge, you can maybe start a club at your own school. You can, in fact, educate others. That's the smallest thing you can do, but it does make a change because then they have the knowledge to tell others and spread the message. Thank you for listening to me. And once again, try to make a change for the better. My name is Olivia Joan Banguet. I'm from New York City, and I'm currently a senior at Convent of the Sacred Heart. So what motivated me to get started in organizing around climate action? Ever since I was a young girl, I've been extremely passionate about the environment and the deterioration of our planet that's been going on for the past couple of years. And when I entered high school, our school had an environmental club, which I joined and that's where my passion for environmentalism really began to flourish. I was learning so much about different subsections of in, of the ecosystem and, and the environment and how to help it and what's going on with it. So I was just getting really curious and I kept doing research and looking more and more um, to find more information about climate action. And when I entered junior year, I actually heard about FXB climate advocates through my friends. So I joined and there I really got to advocate and get people to join our group and I get to spread the word and I learned so much from so many different people listening to so many different conferences and meetings we've had with so many incredible people who really taught me a lot so that is why I started organizing around climate action because it's so important that we take care of our planet because if we don't then soon enough we won't have a planet. Um, so what does restoring the climate mean to me? Restoring the climate means that we need to acknowledge that living in the capitalistic society that we do and the consumeristic society that we do, that all this consuming of goods and deterioration of natural resources that we are using up uh, will not last us forever. So we need to take care of the forests and stop defo deforestating. And we need to s stop polluting the planet and killing s off species. And we need to just clean up our planet and clean up our act. What role do I think movement building plays in climate restoration? I think that movement building plays an enormous role in climate restoration because without a movement, there's no one to back up and help restore the climate. So 
we really need to get people involved talking about it, thinking about it, questioning, getting scared even, because when people are scared, that's what will motivate them to do something about it, because the reality is we will not have a planet if we don't take care of it, and as scary as that may seem, it's the truth, so we need to take action, we need to take action now, and we need to get people talking about it, we need to get the youth talking about it, we need to get everyone together and united and fight to restore our climate. Thank you all for joining us at this special bonus session with Dr. Leslie Field. Leslie Field is the founder and chief technical officer of ICE 911 Research. She's a lecturer at Stanford University and the founder of Small Tech Consulting, specializing in MEMS and nanotechnology. Her current work is focused primarily on Arctic ice restoration, which can be a key and safe lever on slowing climate change. Leslie earned PhD and MS degrees in electrical engineering from UC Berkeley's Sensor and Actuator Center and MS and BS degrees in, in chemical engineering from MIT. Thank you so much to Dr. Leslie Field for joining us today. Can we start off by just understanding what is ICE 911 and what is the work that you do? Well, first, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Erica. And it is so nice to be interviewed by you as part of your Foundation for Climate Restoration panel and, and presentations. This is really, really exciting opportunity. ICE 911 is a, a moonshot. It's a technical moonshot. When I realized that climate change was going to have likely have quite an effect on my own children. I wanted to do something. I'm much more of a technologist than a politician, so I thought, what technical solution could we have? And it started from this concept of, what can I do to work in a safe way on one of the biggest levers on climate change there might be? And that was the loss of Arctic ice reflectivity is in a positive feedback loop, meaning that not that it has positive effects, but that it keeps getting faster and faster. The more it happens, the faster it happens. And so the question I asked myself with the background I have technically, this was a question I knew I could answer. Is there a safe material that could be used to boost Arctic reflectivity? So just that question, is there something I could do? And it started with field work. It moved on to instrumentation to monitor the field work, uh, climate modeling to see what is the impact, what does that mean worldwide. So it's grown as a technical enterprise to establish and really establish with ground truthing, we're calling it ice truthing now, of you know what can we actually accomplish by doing something with as light a footprint uh, you know, on the, on the ecosystem. So a small an amount of material over a small an area. So hair's widths of material over as small an area as possible to make a big impact on restoring Arctic ice. And that's where it started. And then it's grown as, as we'll speak about later, I'm sure, into also, well, you will need some way to make sure this can get adopted, that you can establish how it's safe, how effective, how will it, how will there be governance, how will there be permits, always be transparent on this. And so that's really the story of how it began. And now we're really powering up to bring this moonshot home over the next five years so that we are ready in time to make a difference in time to help save Arctic ice reflectivity before, you know, we're completely ice free in the summer months in the Arctic, which it's predicted could happen by 2030 or so, uh, which runs the risk of some more big tipping points. Can you just very briefly explain what the connection is between your work and climate restoration? Sure. And in fact, um, it was uh, Peter Fiakowski who first looked at what we're doing and said, well, you're restoring ice, aren't you? And it's like, I had been talking about slowing the melt and trying to keep ice getting rebuilt in the way, but restoring is like, that is what we're doing, climate restoration, you're so right. And so we had aligned goals there. 
together. It's such a privilege to be part of a broader ecosystem of climate restoration solutions. And I'm finding that in my Stanford class on engineering entrepreneurship and climate change, many of my speakers are people who are working in this. And uh, it's just been a, a terrific privilege to be collaborating in this group of like-minded people who, you know, we have we have the same goals. We want to restore what we can of this beautiful planet um, to you know, make the future possible for humanity and for all of the web of life that we've had the privilege of, of growing up with and evolving with. That's amazing. So my next question for you is, you know, we all have limitations, especially now, on, on funding, on logistical opportunities, but in an ideal world, if money were no object, what would it look like for you to achieve your goal at ICE 911? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. The no limits question. Um, we have put together a grounds up budget of what we think is actually required in order to get all of the research and development questions on safety and efficacy and economics answered within the five years we think we'd better get them answered. So this is from 2021 to 2025 and it looks like it's just shy of 50 million dollars total to get that work finished in order to be able to answer all the questions that somebody like the UN or the Arctic facing nations, you know, the Arctic Council, whatever organization is going to make the rules and decision of whether this is in the best interest of humanity. So to get all those questions answered, that's what we think it will take. And that's so just to have. just to drive the point home, you're saying that's 50 million year or 50 million dollars, not per year, but total for that five years to get the job done. Total to get the job done and ready to then partner with to hand off to the larger organization, the international organization, that should be then driving implementation at scale. So we're doing relatively small work, scaling it up, making sure that we understand how to deploy it, making sure that there are no untoward interactions with the ecosystem, the marine ecosystems, making sure we've got the really compelling large-scale climate modeling done that shows where you know, there, there will always be unexpected uh, impacts in climate somewhere if we're making an intervention somewhere else. And so what's the smallest intervention we can make that does the job to allow us to maintain Arctic reflectivity? What, you know, where might it get a little warmer, a little cooler, and change the rainfall pattern a bit are very important questions as we're figuring out where's the right place to deploy, how large an area do we need to deploy, you know, all of these questions are very much on the table and those are the things that we need to answer and then to back it up with field testing always. You know, we're, we're now for our first time on actual seawater which will be turning shortly into sea ice with our materials. So. In our ideal world, with this realistic budget actually, what we're looking at is a lot more climate modeling. Field testing in contained and constrained pools with great instrumentation, limited field testing with the right permits out on sea ice itself, um, and just a lot of collaborations on, you know, as I say, safety, efficacy, and just making sure we're getting the job done right. Well, I hope you all have enjoyed learning about ICE 911 and about Arctic restoration as much as I have. Thank you again, Dr. Field, for joining us today and best of luck to you in your Arctic excursions and all of your field testing and modeling uh, that's coming up. So thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Dodds. I really appreciate this opportunity. It's been a privilege.